wonderful to be here. It's to old friends and to make some new friends, I hope. So I've been thinking this past year, um, as the 30th anniversary of the Granite Garden approached, about uh, what's happened since, what's changed, what's the same. I'm in the process of uh, creating a, a new edition of the, of the Granite Garden in ebook form. I own the e-rights. So I've decided uh, to do that and to bring it out this year to celebrate the anniversary, the 30th anniversary of the Granite Garden. It was just published 30 years ago last month. Now, I'm gonna, so I'm gonna be reflecting on the past 30 years uh, in the next half hour or so. And, but I, I want to bracket that by saying that those of us who are in this room today are part of a tradition that goes way beyond 30 years. Uh, in Western tradition, in terms of theory, it goes back to Hippocrates and Aristotle, who wrote about uh, how important it is to uh, adapt urban settlements to natural processes. And in fact, it's, we're part of a tradition that's probably as old as the oldest city, thousands of years old. So we're in this snippet um, of time So I want to talk, start by, by placing the Granite Garden in, in context. Um, in thinking about how to write this book, I wrote it specifically for a general audience as well as for a professional audience, which placed certain demands on the writing and the organization of the book. Um, it's organized in terms of air, earth, water, life, and ecosystems. At the end of each section, uh, there's a of each part of the book, there's a section, what every city should do. And back to Forrester's point, looking from the, what every city should do from the scale of the street corner to the scale of the city as a whole. 20% of the manuscript that I submitted to the publisher was footnotes and bibliography and essay on sources. Uh, they were a little dismayed at first as a book for a general audience. They didn't want to put off the general audience by these heavy duty uh, sources. So if you look at the book, the print book of the Granite Garden, you'll see they printed the back matter in very tiny print so that it didn't look so overwhelming to the rest of the book. But it was in fact a review of the literature at that time in terms of the history and theory of ideas about nature and the city and human settlements. Um, uh, general sources on nature in the city. And it looked at the scientific knowledge and the applied engineering knowledge um, in terms of urban air, climate and air quality, urban land, soils and geology, physiography, urban water, hydrology and water quality, uh, urban plants, urban wildlife, and, and urban ecosystems. It looked also historically um, so many of the cases in the book are from uh, ancient cities as well as from um, 19th, 17th, 18th, 19th century cities. It also took a look at uh, the first chapter, City and Nature, including a look at Boston, uh, natural environment transformed over several hundred years of settlement as a, as a city. And it also looked forward. So the epilogue was a vision of the future, two visions of the future, one taking off from current trends in terms of the infernal city, and the other in terms of the celestial city, taking a, uh, inspiration from Italo Calvino's <coughs> Invisible Cities. So the book came out in 1984, and the strategy worked of, of writing for a general audience. It was reviewed a uh, week of publication in the New York Times Book Review, Washington Post, LA Times, in other places, the Women's League of uh, Voters uh, picked it up in various regions of the country to use as uh, conversation starting points for conversations around um, environmental quality in their own region. But I got a number of unexpected result, um, responses, and I want to share uh, several of those with you, the most important ones, and how that really prompted my work ever since. The first one was, Nature in the city? Oh, you must mean trees and parks. 
And after having written this whole book about air, earth, water, life, and ecosystems, that uh, <laughs> implicit in the Granite Garden was my own definition of nature, which is, uh, is as the, the bio, biological, physical, and chemical processes that sustain, sustain life and shape the, the earth and the universe. But I found that many people had a definition of nature that really was specific <coughs> trees or rivers uh, or parks. Um, so this launched me on a series of uh, research and publications um, on uh, ideas of nature and how they were present in, uh, in urban designers and landscape architects of the past. Uh, one of the first uh, results of that research came out in Uncommon Ground in 1995. Um, and then uh, in uh, <coughs> the authority of nature, <coughs> and confusion in landscape architecture in 1907. Now about this time, other people were beginning to, in the humanities, there was a lot of writing about construction of nature, what is ideas of nature, and Joe Nassauer picked up on this and published an influential book, Placing Nature, Culture and Landscape Ecology. And then Christina Hill and Bart Johnson convened a wonderful group around teachers of ecology and design um, in their uh, edited volume of 2002, and where I was asked to expand this notion of ideas of nature as they, and conflicts and confusion about different ideas of nature, uh, as they are present in both ecology and in landscape architecture. Another, another question that I got from, and this is primarily from professional colleagues, that said, but where's the art? Is this, is this, this seems like this just about function and creating more sustainable, functional, functional cities. This really surprised me because I felt that inherent in the whole book and in particular in the <coughs> epilogue was an implicit notion of a, of a call for a, a new aesthetic for urban design. And so that led to um, both a special issue of Landscape Journal in 1988, and my own essay in that, The Poetics of City and Nature Toward a New Aesthetic for Urban Design. Now, for those of you who are students in the, in the crowd who may, you know, have, may not even have been reading very much in 1988, um, or certainly maybe not knowing what was out there in terms of urban landscape eco ecological design, it was really hard to find good contemporary examples of this uh, notion of that, of the poetics of city and nature. And so a lot of the illustrations in the article are drawn from, for example, Paul Clay, the painter. Um, there were other people thinking about this at the time. Uh, so Jusik Ko had written a master's thesis at the University of Pennsylvania on ecolo an ecological aesthetic. And in 1982, he published um, in Landscape Journal his um, Call for a modern, postmodern design paradigm of holistic philosophy and evolutionary ethic. And Catherine Howitt published a really influential article in 1987, quite short, in Landscape Journal called Systems, Signs, Sensibility, Sources for a New Landscape Aesthetic. Now, it's probably hard for, for those of you who are younger to realize how, 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 how much of a conflict there was at the time in the profession of landscape architecture between ecology and design. And many, many people in the field felt it was like ecology versus design. And my sense was always, why not both? Of course, today, looking at the wonderful projects you're going to see in the next two days, say, this, this conflict is really gone at this point. But it was certainly present then. And one, um, uh, one exhibit and then a uh, special issue of Landscape Journal edited by Brenda Brown, Terry Harkness, and Doug Johnson, eco-revelatory design, nature and constructed nature of the field, was really important in moving forward this notion of a new aesthetic for urban design that makes tangible and sensible and understandable the natural processes that sustain all of us who live in cities. And Herbert Dreisaitl, an artist, become a landscape designer, <laughs> urban planner and ecological planner. Um, this, this kind of example of refined art, artfulness on the one hand, and um, really gorgeous uh, expression of, of natural processes. This is a stormwater project. Um, we're, we're few and far between in 1984. 
course, uh, Beth Meyer's uh, important work, uh, uh, Sustaining Beauty, the Performance of Appearance and Manifesto in Three Parts, came out in 2008. Part of this lineage of trying to think about how uh, we can define an aesthetic that has that encompasses function, feeling, and meaning, that uh, embraces uh, ecology and natural processes <coughs> in art. Well, a third response I got was, well, I can understand how you can apply all these ideas to new towns, but what about existing cities? They're already built. This one really made me tear my hair up. Because I'd worked at Wallace McCart Robertson Todd on all these new towns and ecologically sensitive resort developments. And so the idea that, uh, my whole idea in writing the Granite Garden was to bring the, this approach into the city, not to inspire more new towns or more suburban developments that were ecologically sensitive. So I began a series of uh, research projects. By this point, I was teaching at Harvard and then in 86 went to Penn um, on um, vacant urban land. Uh, and looking at how to restore nature and rebuild community in a series of urban land studios at Harvard GSD in 1984 to 1986, which culminated in um, a presentation I made, a proposal I made to Boston at the time. Boston's major environmental problem in the early 80s was the pollution of Boston Harbor by, by sewer overflows. And what I discovered in my work with my students in these studios at Harvard was this correlation between large square whole blocks of vacant land and the buried floodplains of former streams. So I made a proposal to use um, use these buried these these vacant lands to sto detain stormwater, collect and detain stormwater, and uh, in order to reduce combined sewer overflows and. This was presented in a couple of public lectures. The Boston Globe picked it up and presented it. Uh, I must say, it also began the political education of Ensburn about well, how, how, how difficult such ideas. They may make, seem eminently sensible and reasonable, but how hard it is to shift an engineering culture, to shift a culture in general, to think about these things, to make a connection between vacant urban land in inner city neighborhoods and um, buried floodplains and cleaning up Boston Harbor. So it didn't succeed in Boston, but I went to Philadelphia in 1986 to chair the Department of Landscape Architecture and I started the West Philadelphia Landscape Project where I found exactly the same kinds of patterns that I found in Boston. This, this you're looking at a buried floodplain here. This is a diagonal that goes for about 15 blocks through uh, the Mill Creek watershed of West Philadelphia. And water um, moving to Philadelphia, I also discovered Philadelphia has a combined sewer overflow problem. So I basically started in with the same proposals in Philadelphia in the late 80s. And in 1991, the West Philadelphia Landscape Plan, a framework for action, you see some drawings here. The proposal was the same as the ones basically that I had made in Boston earlier. Um, and taking on also the urban forest and integrating, uh, restoring the natural environment with rebuilding these inner city neighborhoods. These came out in a series of reports in 1991, like uh, Framework for Action and Vacant Land, a Resource for Reshaping Urban Neighborhoods. By 96, what had happened, we had the internet, and so we began to post these, uh, this material on the internet and started teaching studios at Penn, transforming the urban landscape, where my students actually uh, went in, uh, took a vacant lot near a middle school in West Philly, and tried to uh, imagine how, how, how to bring water on streets and sidewalks and pavements uh, to a vacant lot in order to, um, to hold the water. And we coupled the engineer, their engine, landscape engineering uh, class with my studio so that they actually could do some calculations and do design drawings, and this all went up on the internet. I'm showing you the example from Eric Huston, Steve Sattler, to students in that class, here they get into the details of how it could actually happen. Um, we also started working in the mid-90s with a middle school uh, teaching environmental landscape literacy, um, and my students worked with, uh, uh, with 
community residents to design and build some community garden projects. And here you see three uh, young women with historical maps and a vacant uh, block here. They're learning how to read their own uh, <coughs> landscape. This is also on the very floodplain. The project got a lot of attention. Um, the internet certainly helped. Uh, we got millions of hits um, from the time the project went online in 1996. And one of the people that came to visit the project was Bill Clinton um, in 2002, oh, sorry, 1999. And the other folks that came in 1999 were some engineers from the Philadelphia Water Department. I had been trying to get through to the engineers for ten, over 10 years at this point. And finally, it, one part was my students' work went up online. And we gave the engineers, we made CDs, because this is back in the late 90s, you know, I don't know, the, this is dial-up modem time. So uh, we gave, we, we burned 500, we got 500, 500 CDs and we just <coughs> distributed them all over the place, and to many of the people we distributed them to were engineers at the water department. A couple years later, they called me up and said, you know that buried creek you're always talking about? Do you think you could take us on a tour and show us some sites? So this is 1999. We went and took a tour, historical maps in hand, looking at the buried floodplain, looking at the vacant land. The water runs downhill, yes. And we went out for a beer after the field trip, and that was the beginning of Green City Clean Waters, which, if you don't know about it, is an amazing landmark project on the part of Philadelphia to deal with its CSO problem uh, by basically turning 20% of uh, currently paid services into a uh, green surface to absorb the first inch of rainfall. Um, in order to uh, reduce their CSO problem. And it is an amazing project. Um, it went far beyond what um, my students and I have been doing. Um, it's, uh, it's amazing to me, I think, Howard Newkrug, the current water commissioner, is a, is a genius uh, to have made this happen. Um, and I would urge you all to go to www.phillywater.org if you haven't yet to see what, they, um, what they're doing. Um, I've taken my, um, my students at uh, MIT with colleague Jim Wesco back down to Philly to work with the water department and help them in the Mill Creek watershed to look at how one might actually make this happen, both in terms of policies and in terms of design. What I've realized in watching the Philadelphia Water Department implement um, Green City Clean Waters is what cities need is they need reproducible, uh, standardized, not just innovative one-off projects, but they need standardized approaches uh, to really make things like this work in a city-wide way. And I want to point out um, this um, project, uh, the Hold Systems by D Land Studio and uh, Susanna Drake. Uh, this is the kind of thing we need to be thinking of as as designers and planners about how not just to do these one-off great projects, but how to embed these ideas in, um, in, um, in modules and in, 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 in designs that can be um, integrated into a whole city system. And it goes on. We now have a lot of people working on shrinking cities and, and vacant land. And Jill Dissemini just published latest issue of the Journal of Landscape Architecture, an article on to avoid stormwater strategies for abandoned lands. So uh, I think we're really moving forward in these areas. So what's different today? Uh, and in thinking about that, I picked out several things, and you may say, oh yeah, OK, we know that. Uh, or you may be surprised, I don't know. But one of them that strikes me is there's been a real revolution in visualizing ancient cities. And I can't stress how important that is. One can only, back in the, in the 70s, we were trying to think about how to design and plan with process, with natural processes. But our representation techniques of drawing and mapping were just not up to the task. 
they were too static. They didn't show dynamic interactions. And uh, Narendra Junaidja was a genius. I wish, I wish for many reasons, personal uh, as well as professional, that Narendra had not died at a young age because he would have been amazed at what's uh, going on now with geographic information systems and other representational strategies. Um, but this was a map that Narendra devised and when I was working with him on the Toronto Waterfront um, study, putting together an overlay of uh, multiple data from multiple sources to reveal the processes that were shaping the, um, the uh, waterfront of Toronto in order to develop design guidelines. And, you know, just by, two, by the late 90s and early uh, well, late, ni late 80s, early 90s, Jim Corner and Anu Matur and Penn were really revolutionizing representation representational drawings. Um, Jim's book, um, Taking Measures Across the American Landscape, and then uh, Anu's exhibit and uh, book in 2001, Mississippi Floods, I think was a real breakthrough in terms of uh, thinking about how one can pull together these many different sources of information and, and invent drawing methods um, and diagramming methods that would help designers and planners think in terms of these processes. And she's gone on with Philip de Kunha um, to publish uh, other books. Soak is the, is the most recent one, um, Mumbai, Living in an Estuary. Um, but it's, it's, they're so common now, these drawing techniques, uh, that it's, 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 it must be hard to uh, imagine how recent they actually were and how much they have enabled. Now, I'm going to show you. This was the state of the art of GIS. In 1984, when the Granite Garden was published, these are two pages from the Granite Garden of the Dallas Ecological Study. And I think they're probably the most outdated thing in the book. Uh, basically, the book still holds conceptually, and the natural processes are still the same, but boy, have we come a long way in uh, looking at, at geographical information systems. Here's a, this is vintage, this is state of the art in 1988. The West Philadelphia Landscape Project um, GIS mapping. Uh, and this is what we're doing in 2012. We're able to get right, we're able to overlay things and it's just, it's just so much, um, so much richer what one can actually un come to understand about uh, the interaction of um, urban nature and human settlement, the gray area is the very floodplain. We've now been able to map it actually quite, really quite precisely. Well, of course, the internet and social media, but, but imagine um, when, when I published the reports in 1991 for the West Philadelphia Landscape Project, the um, getting them out was, they were paper reports, you know, by, by 1996, we had the internet, and uh, there was that really began a revolution in both the collecting and sharing of information about nature and city. So here, here you see the first time we put this information out on the internet. But I'm going to jump forward to 2008 to work that that um, Sarah Williams, a colleague of mine at MIT, and she was a research assistant on the West Philadelphia Landscape Project in 1998. Um, and in 2008, she was at the Beijing Olympics. Um, she, she designed this monitor for air quality, and she gave it out to AP uh, Associated Press photographers, who then collected the information. She was able to bring it back, display it uh, both spatially, and uh, compare it to the official state Beijing <laughs> air quality measurements. Ultimately, the site got taken down. <laughs> but, um, but, but, I mean, think, think back to those, to that Dallas Ecological Study three, 30 years ago and think to what we can do today with this sort of information. Now, a real, real, real game changer was climate change. And climate change was for sure on the horizon at the time. The scientists had been talking about this idea of the greenhouse effect and global warming decades, but it really hadn't reached the professional consciousness yet. 
and it certainly had not reached the professional consciousness in terms of designers and planners. It really had absolutely not reached the, the, the common culture. Um, Al Gore had a lot to do with that. I think, though, that we should, we should think about climate change as an opportunity for adapting the city to the natural world. Um, when I went back and looked at the Granite Garden and looked at the um, origins of the successful cases that I presented in that book, I started out thinking that most of the cases would be the result of some visionary who had an idea and persuaded other people to implement it. No, there was only a few examples of that. The overwhelming majority, uh, over 90% of the cases I found, were the result of a catastrophe. And after a catastrophe, once it's commonly recognized, people really get down to it. And there's, there's a will there to implement things. So we're already seeing a lot of um, very interesting work coming out as a result of like the Rising Tides uh, um, exhibit at um, MoMA. But one thing, um, I think we're not as uh, design and planning professionals taking enough into account is the wealth of research that's happened in the last 30 years on nature and cities. It's overwhelming. Uh, our colleagues in the sciences have a tradition, as do social scientists and, and historians and humanists, um, of writing review articles. It's usually done by a senior person in the field. And here, as an example, John Arnfield uh, wrote two decades of urban climate research, a review of turbulence, exchanges of energy and water, and the urban heat island. And as a designer planner, most of these, these articles and books won't, won't really apply. But at least 20 to 25 percent do. And it's important for us to really keep up with the latest, not just in landscape ecology, uh, but also across the board in urban, um, uh, in, in urban climate uh, and in, in all the other fields of the urban natural environment. One of the um, pioneers of, uh, of urban ecology, Stuart Pickett, um, who was a dissertation advisor for Alex Felsen, a young landscape architect who worked for a, year, a number of years at EDAW, and then got his PhD in ecology and is now at Yale. And he and Stuart wrote an article together based partly in, on Alex's um, dissertation called Designed Experiments, New Approaches to Studying Ecosystems. This is now then a, a collaboration between ecologists doing research and uh, designer. And just to show you one example of some of the many things, Alex is now teaching at Yale in the, in the School of Forestry. Um, one of the projects that, that Alex is doing is um, the New York City afforestation project where, where the, the whole design is set up as an experiment and that there will be monitoring over time which will yield information um, that will not only benefit scientists but also designers. And here are a few images from uh, this project. You can go to his website and see them. Now, Andrew Pogon Associates was doing research as part of their as part of their mission, really from the beginning. And I think one great example of the research that they've done, sustained over time, is at the Morris Arboretum, starting with back when we didn't have many permeable parking lots. What would a permeable parking lot look like? And they designed and built one at uh, the Morris Arboretum. They worked with um, researchers and developed a beautiful uh, meadow, um, a place to, to, to study succession, um, uh, but, but organized in a way that really fit within this uh, uh, historical landscape of, of the art region. But where, where, where does all of this wisdom and all of this experience, how does it get transmitted and how does it, how does it um, get published? Well, there have been a flood of publications on green cities. I think that, in a sense, we're at a tipping point uh, that um, back in the early 80s, there really weren't very many publications on this topic. And now 
if you just look at the explosion of, um, of work, it's, it's extraordinary. There's uh, the Landscape Urbanism Reader, 2002, uh, Forest and Species, uh, Ecological Planning, Historical and Comparative Synthesis. Oh, this book by um, Herbert Dreisaitl with his colleagues, Geiger and uh, Stempelwiski. Um, I wish it were translated into English. It's a wonderful book. It combines um, Herbert's landscape <coughs> for water with uh, their, 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 their quantitative and technological underpinnings in a really wonderful way. It was by, by Philip Cities in 2010, Ecological Urbanism also in 2010, uh, Daniela Palazzo and Fritz. Fritz Steiner uh, brought out urban ecological design in 2011. And in 2013, uh, Richard Weller put together a history of the 100 years of the University of Pennsylvania Landscape Architecture Department. And it's a wonderful overview of many of these things I've been talking about, about um, ecological design um, in the city, as well as in non-urban areas. And we're looking forward to uh, Chris Reed and Ina Marie Lister's book, Projective Ecologies, which will be coming out this year. There are also a host of great projects built and proposed. And as I, as I mentioned, in 1988, I was really searching for these, um, these sorts of projects. And um, now you go to China and see Kong Jong Yu's work. Um, here, uh, a degraded river, which has uh, been reclaimed with a wetland. This is red ribbon <coughs> parts. You may have seen the red ribbon parts, but here's a wetland part. If I just turned, I turned around, the red ribbons would be right behind me. Um, and then this one, um, the San Lea Green Greenway, also in China, as you can see at the edge of a rapidly expanding urban area. And then this is, I think, one of my favorite unbuilt projects by Stoss Landscape Urbanism and Taylor and Burns, uh, Mount, the Mount Tabor Portland, Oregon project. And Dreisaitl, again, is just doing amazing work in Singapore. Singapore, uh, I think right now, landmarks in terms of water, cities to look to are um, Singapore and Philadelphia. Really, really interesting things going on. Dreisaitl is working with the uh, water folks in Singapore to develop a whole series of public education uh, programs, as well as uh, the, the design and overall planning itself. And then there's Kate Orff's uh, proposal for um, oyster texture in New York City Harbor. Uh, that was also part, I think that was part of Rising Tides, right? Now, I want to make this poignant point to you of how we're losing knowledge. In 1991, Marcia Johnson wrote a PhD dissertation at the University of Pennsylvania on the opportunity to design post-industrial waterfronts in relation to their ecological context, where she designed the oyster texture. And for clams, she, she, she designed all of these habitats in this urban waterfront for, um, for aquatic life. And I want to talk to Kate. I don't know if she's in the audience yet. I want to talk to her to find out if she knows Marcia, who lives in New York City, or knows of this dissertation. And if not, then I think this is a prime example of lost knowledge. Now, another area of lost knowledge, which has the poignant title of dying wisdom, uh, in this case, the rain, um, rainfall and potential of India's traditional water harvesting systems. An example of, of methods uh, of dealing with stormwater from uh, the India sub subcontinent <coughs> that are amazingly fresh and uh, and yet some of them are being are being lost and uh, but for this book which brings me to, again to literature how do we make sense of all of this wealth of research um, and yet the fact that we're losing research that has been done in the past how do we how do we grasp it how do we um, we don't have the, enough time in the day to read everything Really, and really assess it. And that's why we need reviews of the literature. We need reviews of the literature, like what Arnfield did for 20 years of climate research. 
urban climate research. Um, we need that for uh, our own work. We need it for uh, reviews of the various scientific literature in urban air, earth, water, life, and ecosystems as they are uh, applicable to urban design and planning. We need, we need reviews of the best work that's being done in terms of these design experiments, what's being done in practice today. I'm hoping with the ebook, um, The Granite Garden, which is coming out later this year, uh, probably next fall, to update the bibliography review. And I've had a team of research assistants working on this for three years now, and it's just crazy. The, the literature has exploded. I don't know, it's, it's beyond a single individual at this point, I think, to summarize it all. And yet, the challenge for designers and planners is to to know the whole, whole piece, right? So they need help. Uh, we need help. We need review articles uh, to point out what, what is the trajectory here? What are the important threads of discovery? How do they apply to design and planning? Um, where are they? What are the key, what are the key publications you really need to read? And again, this is, uh, I, I started this in a, uh, I was asked by Trinity Banerjee to write a chapter on ecological urbanism for their handbook on urban design, Rutledge Handbook on Urban Design. And I, and I did, but I got cut off because they only had so much space. And so I was had all of these publications. The bibliography got longer and longer and longer, and I had to cut it and pack it back. Um, I expanded it by double in another review article that Tsinghua University published as part of their um, conference proceedings. Uh, whoops, this is... Um, Two decades of climate research by Arnold. By this is the uh, Tsinghua. You can you can get it from my website andersonspurn.com/author/essays and just download it. I own the copyright and the distribution rights, so I can do this. We also need a clearinghouse for models of practice. We have. I wrote about this in 1984 in the Granite Garden. In, in the final chapter, I said, we need a clearinghouse of uh, successful examples of adaptation to the urban natural environment. We need it, it, it needs to be keyworded so you can do searches and find examples that fit your city or your project, what you're thinking about. But we, we need some kind of clearinghouse because you know it's hard to keep track of what the Germans are doing or what the Chinese are doing or what the, you know, folks in India are doing, the ancient as well as the, as the very contemporary. I don't know who can take this on, but it's far more practical to do it today than it was in 1984 because we have the internet. You know, we, we, we have so many, um, and we have digital databases, so we, we really ought to be able to do this. And I think if we're going to be able to, to address the challenges of climate change and other major um, challenges facing us. We, we need this kind of clearinghouse. I'm trying to do my small part. Come to my website, <coughs> Um I have, uh, on the author page, you can find all of my articles and chapters except for uh, two, to which I do not hold copyright or distribution rights. But the rest, you can come here and you can um, students, you know, you, you can, you don't have to pay for them. You can download them. Uh, this includes all of my research monographs and uh, professional reports. Um, come to andersonspurn.com slash landscape architect. You can see them there. Come to my teacher page, andersonspurn.com slash teacher. You can come see all of my syllabi. You don't need a password to get in. There's all the student work there because all the student work since 1996 has been posted online. So you can also see for the various courses, you can see the student work and learn from it as my <coughs> students learn from the work that their predecessors have done from. So in a sense, this is like a model for what kind of a clear, it, it's really not that hard to have a, a sort of clearinghouse. If I keyworded all of my student projects, then that would be the beginning of something. But um, right now it's just by class and by year. And I'm also doing my part uh, to make uh, my work accessible. Um, I own the e-rights to these three books. Uh, my new book, The Eye is a Door, is coming out this month. Uh, oops, March. It's coming out in early March. 
Language of Landscape later this year, and the Granite Garden in the fall um, for the price of $4.99. I hope that that won't provide a barrier to me. That's what my students tell me, that without a second thought, they would plunk down $5. What was it someone said last night? They said, I'll stand you to a Granite Garden. You know, like I said, I stand you to a beer. I'll stand you to a Granite Garden. So, um, That's it. I, I, but before I close, I want to, um, there was one other slide I was going to show that I forgot to put in, and it's a, it's a blog post by um, Kate Orr from the Huffington Post. Uh, I want to urge people to write for a general audience, um, not just to write. We do need to do some professional writing um, and some academic writing, but uh, don't forget that general audience. And, uh, Think for those of you who are already out there uh, speaking to the larger public, it's really important. Thank you.